if you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to the book of Deuteronomy? We're going to go almost to the very end of the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 31. For those of you that have heard preachings on the book of Deuteronomy, and for those of you that may have not, let's just say that the book of Deuteronomy is filled with laws. It's filled with the Levitical laws. It's filled with, if you do this, then this will happen. If you don't do this, then this will happen. The laws that were brought for the children of Israel through Moses, this is after he's given all of the commandments, he's given all of the laws, he's told them and led them through the wilderness for 40 years, and now we get to chapter 31. And it reads like this, And Moses went and spake these words unto all Israel. And he said unto them, I am a hundred and twenty years old this day. I can no longer go out and come in. Also the Lord hath said unto me, Thou shalt not go over this Jordan. The Lord thy God, he will go over before thee, and he will destroy those nations from before thee, and thou shalt possess them. And Joshua, he shall go over before thee, as the Lord has said. Verse 4. And the Lord shall do unto them as he did to Shion and Og, kings of the Amorites, and unto the land of them whom he destroyed. And the Lord shall give them up before your face, that you may do unto them according to all the commandments which I have commanded you. And I like that where he said, all the commandments that I have commanded you. You know basically what he's saying? He said, I'm telling you a law about the law. You know there's a law about the law? The law of the speed limit? So if you don't obey that law, then another law is going to kick in and give you a ticket. So this is the same thing Moses is saying here. The command that I gave you to follow the command that I gave you. It'll take you a minute to wrap your head about it. I think you'll be driving down at 55, and when you speed up to 60, next time you get a ticket, you'll remember the law supporting the law. It's the law to do a speed limit, but the law says what's going to happen. There's a law on top of a law. So he said that commandment, which I commanded you, verse 6, be strong and of good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doeth go with thee, he will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. And Moses called unto Joshua, and said unto him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and of good courage, for thou must go with this people unto the land which the Lord hath sworn unto the fathers to give unto them, and thou shalt cause them to inherit it. And I'm going to stop there for a minute, because if you rem if we just read... Verse 6 said, be strong and of good courage. And then in verse 7, what did he say again? Be strong and of good courage. He said it a second time. And if I may add to it, if Moses were from the south, he would have said something like, my friend from Colorado, I mean California. I met him when I was working security work. And we were both security officers together, a young man. I had just gotten out of the military. He had been in the military, and we seemed to bond a relationship. His name was Matt Bontrager. Matt Bontrager was a true California surfer. He talked like, dude, you know, wait, how do they talk, a surfer? Uh, like, you know, cool, dude. Like, you know, I was hanging out, you know. Like, and so, like, if you take that post, like, I'll take that one, yeah. And I was like, yeah. 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 Five or so years went by, and he called me. And he said, Raymond, I have been in Tennessee entirely too long. I said, why is that, Matt? He said, the other day, my kids were carrying on in the back room just as loud as they could be. He said, I got so mad, I jumped up. And I ran down the hallway, and I put my hand on that door, and he said, this is exactly what he said. He said, I flung that door open, and I looked at him. He said, I already done touched you twice. <laughs> he said, as soon as he said that, he just shook his head and closed the door and walked away. Moses had done toked them twice. Be strong and of good courage. Fear not. Why would he have to make that same, same statement twice in a row? I'm glad you asked that question. Skip all the way down to verse 12. 
And gather the people together, men and women, and children, and thy stranger that is within thy gates, that they may hear, and that they may learn, and fear the Lord your God, and observe to do all the words of this law, and that their children, which have not known anything, may hear, and learn to fear the Lord your God, as long as you live in the land whither you go over Jordan to possess it. And the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thy days approaches, that thou must die. Stop right there and look at me. Moses himself said, I am this day 120 years old. It's kind of like Wayne and Faye saying, as Moses said, I just can't go anymore. I'm getting old. The Lord's already spoke to me. I can't possess that land. I'm not going to go over that land. And now he's telling me that my time has come. How many would like to know when it's your time to come? Anybody? I know I thought about it. I kind of thought I'd like to know, but then I realized if I knew what day it would happen, I would be sure to be absent that day. <laughs> but he kind of knew when his time was up. He knew that his age had caught up to him. And the Lord is calling a solemn assembly. And the Lord spoke to him and said, It's your time to die. Today's message could even be brought along the lines of What's that, you, uh, a eulogy? Wait till you hear this eulogy. But first, let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the reading of your word. I pray that these words would literally, as you said, become alive and active, that they would be sharper than any two-edged sword, that they would accomplish that which you want them to do, that they would encourage us and change us, convict and convince us, that they would lead us into paths of righteousness for your name's sake. I pray, dear Lord, that I would do it right today. And as I do my part, I pray they do theirs as well, that we'd have ears to hear, a mind to comprehend, and a heart to receive that which you would have us know and hear today. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. I was asked to preach a funeral. <laughs> and it was quite funny. Maybe it's the southern aspect of understanding what they were saying. I think maybe I had learned how to read between the lines. And I got that way from a statement that had happened here at Hoover's Gap Church probably uh, 10, 11 years ago. When we first started coming here, they were doing a Christmas play. And during the Christmas play, they asked me to play a part. And I said, yes, I'd love to play a part. And at that time, they said, okay, we want you to wear a clean, dirty shirt. I had to think about that for a minute. Wait, isn't that an oxymoron? Kind of like military and intelligence. It's kind of like clean and dirty. It took me a while to figure out that they were saying, wear a shirt that's got a bunch of stuff all over it, but you washed it. They wanted me to wear a clean, dirty shirt. So I figured that out. And I think over time, I kind of was able to read between the lines when this person who asked me to do their funeral, uh, their family members, looked at me and said, Raymond, I would like you to preach at the funeral, but please don't preach. Hmm. <laughs> you want me to preach at the funeral, but you don't want me to preach? I, I, I took a minute and I'm thinking, was that a clean, dirty shirt? Okay. And, and it, it was the next day that we had got together and we had met that they explained it to me. Raymond, we just don't want that funeral to be a bunch of uh, you're dying and going to hell, you need to give your life to Christ, and they were talking about the gospel message. They just didn't want me to preach a sermon, they wanted me to preach their funeral. And I respect that. I mean, that's, it's, it's for them, it's, for, it's not just for you guys or for me, it's to honor those people. I said, I can do that. The same thing here in the word that we're about to read, here we have God Almighty, uh, Moses himself saying, I'm 120 years old. I cannot cross over. I'm going to tell you, Joshua, twice I'm going to tell you. You need to be strong and you need to be of good courage because I'm about to tell you why, and I hope you listened to me both times. As I am going to read the eulogy as spoken from God and through Moses to the people that he had been leading for 40 years, I would hope that it would be a, a good eulogy. You would hope that you lived your life in such a way 
that you would be emulated, like David emulating Sarge or my children emulating me. You would hope that that would be the case, I would, I would think. In California, I went to a Promise Keepers meeting. There were 50, over 55,000 people at that meeting. I had never been in a large meeting like that. I, I'd never even been to a concert. I'd never been to any kind of event where there were that many people. And so I was taken a little back. I was a little nervous. I, was, I, I literally felt alone, but yet surrounded by 55,000 men in this huge stadium. And just as I was feeling really anxious and nervous, I was ready to just get out of there. All of a sudden, they did something that encouraged me. I saw they did the wave. Anybody ever had the privilege of doing the wave? That was so cool. I saw it just like, just like a wave of water. And all of a sudden, they would come around, and you would stand up and do your hands and then sit down. And, and it went all the way around that stadium. And then they had these big beach balls. Little real life, and they would hit them. It was just going, and I kept thinking, well, whose ball is that? Will they ever get it back? Because that ball would just bounce all the way around that stadium for 55,000 people. So I began to feel more comfortable and felt that I could listen more, and I felt more relaxed. And then I heard the man speaking, and he said, if you were to die today, what would be written on your tombstone? And as I thought about that, I said, what would be written on my tombstone if I died today? And I said, you know what would be written there is, here lies a man, selfish in his nature, worked all the time and loved to watch TV. That was the summation of my life. Here lies a man, selfish in his nature, who loved to work and loved to watch TV. Or he worked all the time and loved to watch TV. And just as I begin to feel despair again and feel down, like, geez, where, what's, what's worth living for now? It's like, oh, my life is useless, and I'm, that's what's going to be on my tombstone. He said, what would you like to have written on your tombstone? I said, aha, that's totally different. Because the way that I am does not necessarily mean the way that I have to die. I have that ability to change that eulogy. I have the ability. In fact, we have the command of the command to be that way if we call ourselves Christians. Then I began to have hope, and I said, I would love for it to say, here lies a man after God's own heart who loved his family more than his job and would do anything for you. That's totally different than who I really am and who I really wanted to be. Reading on in the word, and I'll again start at verse 14. And the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thy days approach, that thou must die. Call Joshua, and present yourselves in the tabernacle of the congregation, that I may give him a charge. And Moses and Joshua went and presented themselves in the tabernacle of the congregation. And the Lord appeared unto them in the... I'm sorry. And the Lord appeared in the tabernacle in a pillar of of a cloud. Oh, Lord, could you imagine what would happen here? We'd run out yelling fire. A, a cloud of pillar, and the pillar of the cloud stood over the door of the tabernacle, and the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, and this people will rise up, comma, stop, and look at me. Just that comma means pause. Now, I don't know how long that pause happened here in the Word of God, but I can only imagine Moses put on his Sunday best. I can only imagine that Joshua put on his most priestly robes as they went and prepared themselves in the tabernacle of the Lord. Because you have to understand, they had what they called ephods with all the twelve stones. They had headdresses. They had rituals and rites that they would follow. I could see them all dressed up for a great big Sunday event. And then here God is speaking and telling them, you know what? These people are going to rise up and go a-whoring after the gods of the strangers of the land, whither thou go be among them, and will forsake me and break my covenant which I have made with them. Then my anger shall be kindled against them in that day, and I will forsake them, and I will hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured, and many evils and troubles shall befall them, so that they will say in that day, Are not these evils come upon us because our God is not among us? And I will surely hide my face in that day 
for all the evils which thou shalt have wrought, in that they are turned unto other gods. Verse 19. Now therefore write ye this song for you, and teach the children of Israel, put it in their mouths, that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. For when I shall have brought them into the land which I swore unto thy fathers, that floweth with milk and honey, that they shall have eaten and filled themselves and waxen fat, then they will turn unto other gods and serve them and provoke me and break my covenant. Verse 21, and it shall come to pass when many evils and trials and, I'm sorry, troubles are befallen them that this song shall testify against them as a witness, for it shall not be forgotten out of the mouths of their seed. For I know their imagination which they go about even now before I have brought them into the land which I swore. Ouch. Oh my. Not quite the eulogy I think he was hoping for. <laughs> Moses, all the work that you have done, leading them these 40 years and going up to the mountain and coming down with these 10 commandments and, and then letting your anger and break and then making 10 more and coming back and, and then co you know condemning them for their golden calves that they made and getting on them because they forsook you and just because you were gone, they immediately, he said, you have led them and you have fed them, you have my staff has broken the water and I've done all these things for you and your end story, the last word you're going to hear, hallelujah, is they're going to forsake me. Your work's in vain. Why did you even bother? Is that not what it would have said to me? I know that's what I would have heard. And I know that to be true because every time I speak, somebody says something that they heard, but I didn't say. When I listen to the tape over again... And I do that regularly, and sometimes I say, man, that was a good message. You know, when I hear it again, I think, man, that was a good message. Same with David Ash. I, I got a double blessing because I would take his messages and record them and send them out. I'd hear them over and over again, and then I would hear the reality of what was said because then I didn't have to process it through my own emotions that I brought with me. I didn't have to then put it into my human context. I could just listen to the reality of what he said, and I heard it the second time, and I go, aha. Sometimes I say, I didn't even hear that. Or, or, wow, that's what he meant by that. So I know that we hear some things that may not be said, or we interpret some things that were said to mean something other than what they are. And I have no doubt that that's exactly what has happened here. One would think, you're telling me it's all for naught. Why? Why bother? There's one scripture if you flip over to chapter 32 and verse 29. Because Moses, in that song that he had written, he told them to remember the days of old and consider the generations and that the children should ask their fathers and their other fathers and ask them, what does all this song mean? In verse 32, chapter 32 and verse 29, Oh, that they were wise, that they understand this, that they would consider their latter end. Can you hear the heart of God today? Because as we are in humanity, even in the presentation that I read those words, I did it in my emotion. I did it with, what would it be called when an act you know what I'm saying I did it with my presentation I love that one movie I don't recommend it but the lady was asked to play a role and she was asked to say a statement in all of the different emotions saying the exact same words but this time you say it with anger and then this time you say it with uh, heart, heart uh, crying and this time you say it with whatever emotion Thank you. In character. So in that character that she had to change that character, in the character in which I presented it, I presented it with, a, with an anger and a force and, and with almost, uh, what's that, 
Thor character with that big hammer? Is that who is this? You kids, is that Thor that has the big hammer? And he, he, you know, I want to slam that hammer down. That's the character in which I read that. But I don't believe that that's the character in which the spirit of the living, loving God would have him know that. I believe that he would have said that with tears in his eyes. That he would have said that with concern in his soul. That he would have said not in his soul. He doesn't have a soul within his spirit. Those that worship me must worship me in spirit and in truth. He would have said within that spirit's understanding. You're going to deny me. You're going to do things that I never even taught you to do. You're going to be tempted to go in a place that I would never have you go. I'm bringing you to the promised land. How sad I feel that I know you're going to do something that's going to break my heart. The God that we serve is able to continue his blessing from generation to generation. And I'll close with this. If Tony and Tim, if you would come and you want to start getting prepared. Because as I continued my study, continuing in verse chapter 32, this time at verse 51, if you want to read that, you can underline it if you want, because to me, yep, just pick it straight up. There we go. Pick it up. Yep, perfect. Sorry about that. Because I often thought, why wouldn't Moses be able to go? Why couldn't Moses go into the promised land? What did Moses do that prevented him from going across the Jordan? After 40 years of leadership, they're going to change the CEO? After 40 years of dedication, he's going to say, look, read verse 51. Because you transgressed against me among the children of Israel at the waters of Meribeth Kadesh in the wilderness of Zin, because you sanctified me not in the midst of the children of Israel. Thou shalt not see the land. Be I mean, he should see the land. That's verse 51, 52. Hear me today. Moses transgressed and he sanctified not. If you just take a moment though and put yourself in Moses' shoes, how would it feel? Lord, thank you for that revelation. Ooh, hallelujah. Michelle says it best, I think. She says, sometimes, Raymond, you feel so spiritual, and I know when you're in that moment. There's such a solemnity that's flowing through my soul, and I feel so close. I told her, there's times I want to call every one of you. I really do. And I just want to call, and I say, I, I want to tell you what God's done, but he's not done anything. I just want to tell you that God is alive, and he loves you. And I think they'd think I'd stupid if I just called him and said, God loves you. And because I have nothing to say with it, I just feel that compulsion in my spirit. And I can't, it's like the word says, the words are just like groanings inside of me. I feel so close to him. And then I'll walk out of that and wham, right into an argument, right into a dispute, right into loud yelling. And I'm, oh God, why does that always happen? I feel so close, but yet I do so wrong after. I can almost see Moses doing that same thing. He said, because you didn't sanctify me. Think about this. Moses, the God inscribed in front of him the Ten Commandments of life that we still have to this day. I don't know if he knew that it would be such a historical, a stor historical, not hysterical, historical event as making the Ten Commandments. He was very close to God. In fact, it says he passed right by him. How close can you be? And then you come out of that atmosphere. I know he had to have his head held high and his chest out. He's, I've been with God. I've been with the creator of heaven and earth. I am so excited. And you guys have already took all your gold and 
made an image of a calf and, and you're worshiping it? You're pouring blood on the altar and I, I just told you we have a living God and he said, have no other one before me. I can see him being angry. I can see him being upset. I can see him going from that loving moment in a study to an anger management opportunity on how to fry chicken. I can see that. But no matter how many times I see that, no matter how many times it happens in our families or in ourselves, this truth remains the same. God's love for you doesn't change. He knew they would forsake him. He knew that they would serve other gods. He knew that they would deny him. But he had that hope that says, no matter how far you go, you're going to come back to me. No matter how bad it gets, you know I'm right here waiting for you. Amen? Remember that today. Let me hear Bruce's. <laughs> One more time. And again. Yes. Man, I love that. Glory. Hallelujah. Tony or Tim first? Tim, come here, my friend. Come here, my friend. I want you to stand up here, and I'm going to read something to you. As you Just go ahead and stand right here. Go ahead and don't, no, just stand right here. Right here. Just put your hands there so you don't slip and fall. Stay right here for one second. Can I have a gentleman that would help make sure he doesn't slip or fall? Come here. There we go. Just as I read that. Man, what a gentleman. I, you know him. I know. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Come on. Then I'm going to read this real quick. In the book of Acts, we hear of a great story. And it reads in chapter 8 and verse 26, and it says, The angel of the Lord spoke unto Philip, saying, Arise and go towards the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopian, an Enoch of great authority under Candace, queen of Ethiopians, who had charge over all her treasures and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot. He read Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. The reality is they saw a baptism. They actually, before the baptism happened, they had already approached us. We want to get baptized. And so when we saw that, they were immediately reminded. Remember the message last time? Love, remembrance. And that remembrance, that's the same thing that happened here. Join thyself with thy chariot. And Philip ran after him and heard he read the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you readeth? And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? And that's what we all do as a church. We're going to guide these people. And he desired, Philip, that he would come up and sit with him. In the place of the scripture which he read, and we'll skip on down, because here's where the reality is. Philip then opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto certain water. Hey, we just happen to have a baptismal full of it. And the Enoch said, See, here is water. What doeth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Tim, I ask you, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? My friend, why don't you walk up these stairs and I want you to sit right here. So turn around and sit down right here. There we go. Perfect. If you would now, I need you to pick your feet up and slide. Turn all the way around and put your feet in the water. There we go. And turn around. Perfect. Good job. And pick them up. Awesome. Yep, there we go. And set them in the water for me. Is it warm or cold? <laughs> it's okay, good. Perfect. And then get in there and sit all the way down, please. Come all the way in the water and sit down. There we go. Perfect. And put your feet, can you put your knees all the way up here? Yeah, keep walking up there all the way to the end. Yes, sir. All the way to the end. Way up here. Can you go a little more? We're wonderful. There we go. Outstanding. Tim, on your profession of the faith of Jesus Christ and the knowledge of the same, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's hear it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Give me a towel. Hallelujah.
Hallelujah. Come on out. Come on back up. You're just going to slide back. There we go. You can walk if you want. Perfect. Good. And you're going to sit down again. Yep. Sit down. Awesome, Tim. Look at that smile. I like that. Spin your feet around. Perfect. Come on around. Outstanding. That's it. All the way around. It's okay, Heather. They're weatherproof. That's it. Come on down if you want to go that way. That's fine. There you go. All right. Go ahead and step down. Either side. Perfect. Well done, Tim. Well done. Let's hear it again. All right, let's go over there and change. Can you go with Heather? Go with Heather? Let's get you changed in some dry clothes. She'll get some dry clothes on you. Good job. Outstanding. Perfect. Got him, Heather? All right. Tony, the same question. You believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? You're the... You believe Jesus Christ helped you with that? That's the reason. 44 years. God has blessed you, my friend. Turn around and sit down right there. Spin your feet all the way around and put them in the water. Perfect, perfect. That's it. You're going to skid all the way down in the water. And then slide all the way to the front. Put your knees all the way to the front. A little bit more. Forward. Keep coming, keep coming. There we go. Now to help me, if you would put your hand on your right hand on your nose and put your left hand over your right hand, that'll help me pick you up. Based on your profession in the Lord Jesus Christ, I now baptize thee in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. We praise you, Lord. The reason he is alive, the name of Jesus Christ. Glory, glory, glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We thank you, Jesus. Woo! Glory! <laughs> In the name of Jesus, life all new. Woo! <laughs> glory, glory, glory. You're going to slide back. Here we go. And you can sit up on the edge again. Nice and easy. It's slippery and wet. Keep coming back. Keep coming back. Here we go. Glory, hallelujah. We pray for health and healing. Spin your legs all the way around. Put them on the steps if you can. Hallelujah. Step on down and Heather will take you in the, get you back there and get you dried off. God bless you, Tony. Thank you. Don't worry about that, Heather. It's made to be wet. I'm with you. Walk with, all right. Hallelujah. Need that back there. Thank you, Heather. God bless you. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that church growth? Isn't that the church growth we would rather see than numbers? That is so good and so wonderful. Thank you all for being a part of this wonderful, momentous occasion. Thank you, Jeff, for sharing out of the abundance of your heart. And as Sarah said, you better hold her to it. She's a woman. She'll get on you now. Sing for us again, will you? Outstanding. As the Lord leads, we don't want to press you. As the Lord leads you. All right, as the Lord leads you, bless y'all. Anybody have anything before we dismiss? Sir, I asked if anybody had anything else, and David said yes, and he pointed to the clock. <laughs> Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we ask for your blessings this day as we get ready and as we depart into our separate ways. I pray that that word that we've spoken about, that we hear, Lord, that some are going to be led astray, that some are going to deny you, but we understand, Lord, and bring to our remembrance that you have never changed. You forsake us now. You are there waiting for us even though you know what could happen. So, Lord, I pray that you would give us the strength that we would acknowledge you, that we would worship you, that we would come together with a heart of expectation and anticipation what you're going to do for us and through us and around us. So, Lord, as until, we, until we meet again Wednesday for prayer and praise or Sunday for worship, I pray that you would bless each one as they go their way. Use them, Lord, as a light in the dark world in which we now live. Bless them in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. God bless you.